When our Vietnam veterans came home, there was no celebration, only the relief of family and friends. The country was in chaos over the Vietnam War. It was a time in history like no other, a country divided. We came back broken in body and soul, and no one said, welcome home. kind of put you in a, in, in a frame of mind that maybe that's what you wanted to do. You wanted to be a hero. And I think that's pretty much why I joined the Army. It wasn't out of patriotism. It was out of not having a job, and that was an option for me, uh, to join the Army. Well, I felt, uh, I felt like I was doing my duty as an American. And, uh, and I thought it was my time. So I felt good about it, actually. And uh, I was a little nervous or whatever about it. But uh, it, was, it was a challenge, and I was, uh, I was up for it. Uh, after 1966, the draft came out for the war, and I was uh, decided to enlist so I could go into the warrant officer flight program and learn to fly and uh, was pretty sure I was gonna end up in Vietnam. Back then, you just went and you followed the program. And that's, that was it. I didn't have any political knowledge of what was going on in Vietnam. I didn't even know what a Vietnam was. When I first arrived there, <clears throat> it was confusing. It was a total loss. We had areas set up for, to prepare for the troops when they came, which would be about two or three weeks later. Uh, totally lost, totally confused. When I first got to Vietnam, I, I got off a C-130 and they put us on another aircraft to a base called Dong Ha, which was a, a very forward base in the I Corps area. And we spent the night there, and the next morning we were getting picked up by a helicopter. There was a group of us, probably about a dozen guys. And we had no weapons, all we had was our sea bags, our duffel bags. And helicopters flew in, in line, to pick us up. And those helicopters were just bringing in dead and wounded from a battle that was going on a few miles from us uh, called Operation Hickory in the DMZ. And we were standing on that flight line as they carried these guys off in ponchos. And I, I never forgot that sight my entire life. Uh, it, 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 with the experience I even had in the Marine Corps, I really was not in touch with how horrible this could be until I saw that. And they walked past and there was, uh, there was actually blood dripping out of the ponchos onto the deck. And, uh, you could see the boots sticking out of the bottom, and I realized that these were real guys. And uh, that, that, that kind of really snapped me awake. When I got there, literally flew in by with a helicopter and got off the helicopter in a jungle. Uh, my experience is what, um, I didn't see any live people from 1-9. All I saw was bodies. That was my initiation into Vietnam. It was um, reality set in the first time. We're here, this is the real thing. There's no training, it's, it's nothing to read about or talk about, this is it. We're in the belly of the beast. And I remember looking at my watch, it was 10 to 10, and um, I started to travel one way, and my platoon sergeant told me to go the other way, and it took like about three steps and I stepped on a landmine, and I went like about 35 feet up in the air. I remember 
I don't remember hearing the explosion, but I remember seeing the mountain off to the right turning around. And I landed on my back. And they called in uh, three medevacs. And the first two landed on landmines. And the third one came in and got us out. And I remember the, you know, I'd look down and I'd saw that my legs were like, it, it was, it was a, I didn't even want to look at them. They were bringing in replacements. We only could be supplied by helicopter. We had a small LZ right behind my bunker. And sometimes when they were bringing the replacements in, they were coming from our ship in some cases because that's, we were, you know, we, we were the special landing force. And some of those Marines would jump off the chopper and get killed. And we put them back on. I, um, I was shot, sniper, sniper shot me. Um, I didn't know I was shot. All I felt in my arm was like somebody had jogged me in the arm. And when I went to grab my rifle, all I saw was like the rifle firing down. It didn't move up. So when I looked at my arm and saw the blood squirting out of my arm, I goes into panic. They say shock. <laughs> but when people see life leaving out your body, it's a whole different feeling. I mean, you go berserk. But that was the... Um, that was a chaotic day. That, 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 was, that was like, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it out of here? Because all hell broke out. I had, um, I had given up. Some of my friends were shot, which you couldn't do anything. The corpsman that, when they mentioned corpsman up to, to, to do my arm, to treat me, um, he was shot also. And the thing that happened is um, when they tried to land the helicopter in to medevac me out the first time, we was positioned on a hill and the um, helicopter couldn't land on the hill. But when the first med, we call them first meds, when they came, all hell broke out on the helicopters. The helicopters came in to pick me up and they had to leave out. They had to go back. They sent in the Cobras. The Cobras came in landed gunfire where, they, where we told them that the, the um, enemy was at, and they left. And when the helicopter came the second time to get me out, the guys told me, Sergeant, you're going home. You're going home, Sergeant. And, and I'm looking down at the guys, drugged up. I see the guys waving, waving, the helicopter pulling up. And I felt bad. I, I feel bad up until now, but I did get in contact with a few of the guys. And um, I felt bad because I had to leave them. I didn't want to leave. I did not want to leave. Uh, but the first contact after that, I, I met a friend of mine named Larry First. Uh, maybe, say about 10 years, I hadn't gotten in touch with him. And that, that stayed on my mind, how these guys came out of this, how they make it out of that valley. And when me and Larry First um, contacted each other, he said, he said, Sarge, he said, when you left, he said, you should have seen the fireworks. So you should have seen the fireworks, and you know, I uh, we glad that each other came home. Well, I, I had a I had a situation happen to me um, when I was in Vietnam. I watched a Chinook helicopter um, turn over on its back, turn upside down, and the um, the helicopter was at approximately four thousand feet, and it was rocking back and forth like this. And I kept rocking back and forth, and I kept watching it. And I was standing on a berm, looking at this helicopter do this. I'm saying to myself, what, what, it must be a test flight. I, I thought it was a test flight. And at one point, it just did this, and it started coming down. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And that helicopter just kept coming down. Further along the perimeter were bunkers. And the guys that were in the bunkers were watching this helicopter come down, and they started taking off, and they started running. At around 1,000 feet, panels started coming off the helicopter. Parts started coming off the helicopter. When it hit the ground, I don't remember a sound. I don't, I don't recall hearing a sound, but the fireball was immense, and I felt the heat of it. I had a nightmare. That nightmare stayed with me 
for, for decades. It was unbelievable. I, I would wake up in the middle of the night dreaming about that, that helicopter and the guys that were in it. Um, that didn't leave me for a long, long time. We went up there, they say, with maybe 600 uh, in the beginning of September, the, the, the battalion, and we came back at the end of October with less than half uh, that number that were fit to fight. When we went back two weeks later to recover the bodies, we found them mutilated. Uh, in fact, they had tacked onto a tree a, a Marine Corps tattoo that one of the Marines had on his chest. And that's something we never did to the enemy. My roommate, um, whose name is Bill, he uh, and his, his uh, aircraft commander uh, were shot down early in the morning on a mission over by Anke, and there was a lot of bad people there that day. Uh, we had three teams of gunships working that area, and it was still very, very intense. And I was on one of my, my very treasured days off and got a call from the ships saying, we need you here with the hog. Now the hog is the one with the big nose and all the ammunition and 38 rockets. And I flew out with the hog. We, I gathered up a crew from wherever I could find it, anybody who was off that day, and flew out and uh, saw where the place where my roommate was, uh, which they had set up a, a perimeter around their ship in the wrong direction. They didn't know where the enemy was either. Uh, however, I did, uh, because through much direction from the other ships that were there, they were instructing me exactly where they were. So, and then watching them fire, you could tell. And I dumped every rocket I had, every hand grenade I had, every chunker I had on that place. And Dust Off got in and took them out. So it was a, I can't tell you how many holes I had in my airplane, but it didn't matter. You know, and nobody was hurt, so we were very lucky. I, I learned that there were different flavors of fear. You know, like there's fear of the dark, and there's fear of heights, and there's fear of um, not passing your math test. And, but there's, there was nothing like the fear I felt when someone was shooting at me. It was sort of like a, a dread. It was sort of like a, a low in the, in the stomach fear, fear. I have never felt that fear again. I, I, when the day I left Vietnam, that fear left, but I, I still remember it. I still remember that, that flavor of fear. The questions were pretty much the same. You know, how do you feel about Vietnam? How do you, um, how do you stomach having killed people? Uh, how do you feel about the friends you lost? Uh, all very common questions. Um, uh, when they find out you're a gunship pilot and they knew that's what your job was, they would say, you know, you think it's going to bother you the rest of your days, you know. Well, yeah, yeah it will. Um, you can't walk away from something like that and not have it leave you. It's not going anywhere. So I've been, you know, I just, when I came back, I think I felt I had more compassion for individuals, not for the human race. And the human race is a disgrace, but for individuals, if uh, I, you know, I set out to help people and I'm still doing it. And it's always that second guessing. Go left instead of right, go straight instead of zigzag or whatever. If you said or did something, you waited 30 minutes, waited an hour, go earlier, go later, you always question that in your mind. Did I do the right thing? But whatever I did, they're dead. There was four letters in the alphabet that no one ever heard of at the point, that point, and it was PTSD. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, didn't exist when I came home, and I, I was fully immersed into it. Uh, and back in those days, they just told you to get it together, you're home now, get your life together, you don't even have to think about it anymore. It wasn't that easy. I, I, I was, um, I was, I was in bad shape when I came home. Post-traumatic stress to me was some phrase that was used uh, by guys. Uh, I, I really didn't know what it was, what it meant. I kind of had an idea, 
but it looked like it was, uh, to me, it looked like it may be some kind of an excuse of some type. Uh, I don't mean to be cynical, but that's how it looked to me. Now, I have a son who's in the Marine Corps. He's been in the Marine Corps 16 years. And when he came home, the Marine Corps has a policy today that they didn't have back in the 60s, and they call it deflating. And deflating means that you come back and for a couple of weeks before you get turned loose on the streets of your old neighborhood, you got to spend time with doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists and so forth to sort of deflate you, let the bad air out, I guess. And he was talking and they were, he was talking about his experiences and they, kind of suggested that he had some serious PTSD and he called me up on the phone that night and he says, you know, they, they're, they've determined that I have PTSD, Pop, he says, but I think you ought to see somebody at the VA about it. <laughs> I said, why? He says, you have the worst PTSD I've ever seen. Now looking back at it in the last six years, I have, if, if you didn't show me what it was, then I wouldn't know. But, you know, the two marriages, my time drinking, uh, you know, drugs, um, the short-term memory is just like it's killing me. You know, I just joke about it. So in some ways there is a possibility, and I've heard it before, you could have PTSD but you have it under control. PTSD doesn't mean that you're out of control all the time. It, it is a real thing, when they dis especially when they discuss your past after returning from Vietnam, some of the things you do. Uh, my involvement with alcohol was horrible. Uh, I, I'm, I, I don't like to brag about it, that's not bragging, but uh, I, I don't mind talking about it if it's gonna help somebody else. Uh, I, I had a very bad temper. Uh, so these things were, were manifestations of PTSD. And uh, most of us, especially Vietnam, had pushed it way down, but it's not gone. It's, not, it's always there, and given the right moment, it will come back up. We was uneducated. The Vietnam War, they didn't educate us on anything. All we had to do was go out and kill the enemy. But um, we brought the enemy back here. And I'm talking about the Agent Orange. When they sprayed it, it had to be a rainy day because during the monsoon, it rains, rain. So it had to be close to the monsoon where it would stop. And that next day, a couple of days, the, the vegetation would just just cook up like somebody had just put them in the oven and cook it. And that's a lot of areas that we were in. We saw it all over. We saw it down south where I was initially. We saw it up uh, near the forest in, in the, uh, near Camp Evans. Uh, it was all over. The, uh, you could see it on the leaves of the vegetation like a powder of some sort. Uh, it's left its mark on me. I've had cancer from, uh, related to uh, Agent Orange. And it's, it's actually, I don't think there's one person in Vietnam that it hasn't affected because it was all over and it doesn't dissolve. Once it's in the fat of your body, it's there, it's a dioxin. Many of us are Marine Corps, many of us soldiers, many of us that fought in Vietnam. We have to, um, we have to continue fighting. When we came home, we were the losers that lost the war. That's how they treated us. And I think that's one of the reasons, or the main reason we didn't speak about it for so many years. How did I feel when I came back from Vietnam? First of all, it was a big, it, I was ecstatic that I was coming home. Uh, it was great. Getting off the plane uh, and seeing my wife and then seeing what other friends, but it was then, I got a sense of, of embarrassment. You were looking at people, or people were looking at you, and later on you know, I would hear the word, you know, baby killer, you know, uh, druggy, and it was depressing. Um, 
it, it was not, I, I didn't expect to come home and march down the streets of New York with a ticket tape parade. Uh, I thought that would happen <clears throat> at some point at the end of the war and people would have a parade. Never happened. I immediately, upon coming home, was faced with some interesting scenarios right off the bat. Uh, getting on the plane uh, at uh, Seattle, Tacoma to come back to New York. I bought myself a first class ticket, 180 bucks. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in full uniform, proud of myself, proud of my service. No sooner got on the plane than was asked, a stewardess was asked, what is that soldier doing in first class? She was very nice. She asked me for my ticket and she said, you just relax now and we'll get you a drink and don't bother about him. And she went back to that gentleman who was only a couple of seats away. Why he didn't ask me, I don't know. And said, sir, that young officer probably just stepped out of the jungles of Vietnam. If you bother him, he'll probably kill you. And if he doesn't, I will. <laughs> the big one for me is don't blame the warrior. You know, we were young kids. We're going to get sent to where we're, we're, we're going to go where we're sent and we're going to do our job. And when we came home, we were sort of blamed for the politics of the war along with everybody else. I never spoke out about the war in Vietnam, ever, because I left too many friends behind that were alive and too many of them were killed. I, wouldn't, I, didn't, I couldn't do that. We fight the war, we fight it to the best of our abilities. I don't think we ever lost the battle in Vietnam, but we lost the war. It wasn't the soldiers' fault. And for soldiers coming home to be stigmatized, I don't know that it'll ever happen again, but I know it happened to me. And if anyone should learn by anything about Vietnam, is never to, never to blame the soldiers, because they're doing exactly what they're told to do, and they're doing it well with honor, and that's it. I would like to say, for those who are serving our military, um, and the civilians here in our country, think first of these people that's defending our nation. You have to reach out to all of them. Give them a welcome home. Vietnam, we didn't get that welcome home. Those they send to fight the battles for this country, do so in an honest, meaningful way. They join the service as a sense of commitment to their country. They're not political. They go where they're told, they do what they're told, and they fight hard, and they give. And the giver never doesn't stop after they get home. So if you're gonna do it, do it the right way and honor these veterans.